Hey, welcome back from your lunch break. Um, if you're in Melbourne, I hope you got outside and took a walk around the block. It's a beautiful spring day here, which Melbourne seems to do quite well. Uh, okay, so my name is Saul Kaganoff and I'm your MC for this afternoon session in hey, the good strategy and stream. Welcome back to the stream for the afternoon. Days. Um, I hope you had a great break. Oops. Uh, and uh, so I'm your MC for the afternoon session. I want to introduce you to Demir Trucha, who joins us from Sydney. Uh, Demir is the C CEO of a company called Basic, which does financial data aggregation. And his whole product uh, platform is based on APIs. And it's a really great example of some of the new um, new business models that are being empowered by APIs. So let me introduce you to uh, Demir Trucha. Thank you, Demir. Thank you. Um, excellent. So uh, I guess, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I look forward to give you a bit of an uh, overview of open banking, uh, specifically of what's happening here uh, down under. i give you a bit of the lay of the land, and I'll also uh, cover how some of the companies and some how some of our customers are transitioning from the methods that they're using at the moment to acquire data over to open banking APIs as well. But just before I go in, just to give you a quick overview, in case you haven't heard of who BASIC is or what, what we do, um, effectively we're an API platform. We provide API access to financial data. So we connect to, to over um, 100 different institutions within Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so we provide APIs that enable you to access banking data, super fund data, and card issuer data. We support over 200 fintechs uh, in Australia and New Zealand combined. And one thing that we're kind of quite proud of is just how use case agnostic our platform is. So, which I think is really important if you have an API platform. And also just to give you a quick overview of some of our investors. So we um, are quite kind of blessed to have the likes of Plaid, um, Westpac, NAB, Salesforce, and Afterpay Ventures as well um, that uh, have joined our board too. So I'll give you a quick overview of, uh, I, I can't talk about open banking unless I give you an overview of consumer data rights. And for everybody who already knows what consumer data rights is, I'm sorry, um, the first part will be boring, but I promise that the second part of the presentation, um, I'm hoping you will pick up something new. Uh, so I'll try and get through this pretty quick. So for those of you who don't know, Consumer Data Right is an initiative that's been headed and um, up by the Australian government. And the whole premise around Consumer Data Right is acknowledging that consumers should be in charge of their own data. And being in charge means being able to electively decide who they share their data with. So the government said, okay, well, we know data is really important to the economy. Uh, we know that if we, that it's, we acknowledge this to consumers and if we provide the framework by which consumers can share the data from point A to point B, we believe that that will create quite a bit of competition um, and innovation in the actual market. So that's how they've kind of spearheaded this. So you might've heard open banking in the UK and open banking in other jurisdiction. It's nothing like this. This one's uh, industry-wide initiative, starting with the banks, moving all over to utilities, then to telcos and then other um, industries, including government, like their own data. So I think that that's kind of really important to note. So what does that ultimately mean? Well, that means that for each of the segments that they target, um, they're, they're actually forcing them to open up the data that they hold on the actual customer. Obviously for a customer consent managed process, but they're effectively saying, um, you know, you fit within this particular segment industry, i.e. banking, for example, you hold consumer's data, you need to develop these type of APIs and you need to give um, consumers the ability to share that, to share it willingly with um, other parties as well. So, so it's, it's, Quite exciting, I guess, one, because it's industry-wide. Um, I'm quite kind of excited about CDR in the sense that it's not just banking, it's utilities and other things as well. And one of the things I look forward to is the mishmash and intertwining of that data and what things we'll be able to produce in the actual future. 
So if we kind of move on, just to give you a few kind of key facts around consumer data rights. So one, it's run by the Australian Treasury. Um, it's enforced by ACCC. Uh, you cannot consume open banking API services unless you're accredited, which I think is one of the big friction points that we have at the moment in this whole kind of regime in the, the fact that at the moment as it stands, and they are going to change this and fix it up. Um, it's a six month process to become accredited. Uh, and once you're accredited, then you can go make your first API call. So you have to do six months of accreditation, then you have to do your development and then you can start to consume the data services. I don't know one API out there that takes that long to call. Um, so I think that's something that we definitely kind of miss, but um, it is the first kind of pass at it um, and there is an intention to make it better. Um, consumer data rights actually defines a set of consent management rules. Obviously, not only does it uh, state for each industry what the API needs to look like, but it also provides the framework by which how that data is handled as well. I've kind of bundled that underneath um, something I call kind of consent management rules. Uh, and then the other thing is once you become accredited, there is also kind of what's called a register, which is effectively a directory listing of every accredited entity. And it's actually a key part of an API call. So you cannot just consume data. Even if an accredited body um, calls an API from a bank, for example, that bank will go query the register to say, hey, are they allowed to receive data? Are they accredited or not? So what you see on the right there is kind of what some of those key four elements are as part of this entire regime. So there's the data holder, i.e. a bank um, in this instance. There's the recipient, the app developer that wants to consume that data. Maybe it's a personal finance management app or something. There's a consumer who's triggering off all of this, who's directing the bank, the data holder to share the data with the data recipient and so forth. And there's obviously the register that says, you know, whether the recipient is allowed to receive this data or not. So that's kind of what the key elements are. And uh, just kind of moving forward, just to give you a bit of an overview of what type of data is accessible. Um, if you don't know, now you know. Uh, it's, um, it's effectively everything that you see when you log onto your internet banking portal. So if you think about your everyday banking, you're gonna see accounts in there, you're gonna see transactions, you're gonna see your billers, um, your address book, you're gonna see your pays. Um, one thing you don't see is actually product information. You do see a little bit of it, but for the API, you can get a lot more kind of product information. So that's, um, and on the right, you can kind of see a sample um, kind of data schema of what the, you know, what you could expect to see if, um, if you made a call to get account details. So I, I hate kind of talking about CDN and open banking by giving you some practical examples. And this is just some of our customers that use our platform. So Pocketbook, which you may or may not have heard, it's a personal finance management app, like a PFM app. And effectively what it does, it, it helps you budget, helps you save money. So it shows you exactly um, where all your money's going, um, how much you spend on a daily basis uh, as well, all with an intention to help you kind of save. Um, another customer we've got is Upstreet. <coughs> what Upstreet does is it actually, once you've linked your bank accounts up, it actually monitors the transactions that you're making, I, what, what you, who you're spending with. And what it'll do is like, whoever you're spending with, it'll actually actively invest um, uh, a roundup amount into that particular company. So for example, if you regularly uh, spend money at Coles or Woolworths, because that's just, you're spending there all the time, actually with each one of those spends, you'll actually automatically also invest in their shares as well. So it's a, good reward system. I'll give you money, but give me something um, in return as well. Um, we have Greener, <coughs> who also recently launched as well. And what Greener does um, is absolutely amazing what they've been able to do actually is they've, once you've linked up your bank accounts, they're actually able to get a list of all of your transactions and again, they, and against those transactions, they identify the merchants that you transact with and a, Based off that, they can actually calculate what your carbon emission is overall. And then they help you kind of um, make smarter choices the next time you spend. So you can make more kind of greener choices, great benefit for the environment. Um, and finally, um, another kind of example is we've got uh, before pay that enables um, individuals to access their wages earlier, kind of on demand um, with constraints built in. 
Uh, and one of the things that they do is they leverage financial data to help do a very, very far risk assessment before they enable individuals to be able to draw on their income earlier. So these are just some examples, some kind of practical examples of how financial data is being used. Um, and kind of, we're in a really funny stage at the moment because what open banking as a concept, yes, the accreditation part is new and yes, the API spec is new, but the ability to be able to access financial data is not new. So um, these are APIs have existed for the last 20 years. Um, you, some of you might've heard of companies like Yodely who's been around for a long time. <coughs> and, um, and effectively um, the, way, the way we've been providing access to this financial data hasn't been the most optimal way. And we're still, um, I would say 98% of all financial data acquisition is still done in this way. And that's through kind of digital data capture or what we call kind of, or sometimes referred to as screen scraping. Even though it's not screen scraping, um, effectively what most of these um, companies even basic do is we actually consume banks um, unofficial APIs in order to be able to kind of pull the data out and surface it. So, we're in this kind of funny time because all of those fintechs that I showed you, plus many, many more, um, they actually rely and use this data all the time. So open banking for them is not new, um, but open banking does offer additional security. Um, the accreditation um, is also kind of welcome once we can find out better ways to be able to roll it out. Um, and also creates a bit more reliability around the actual service as well. So. We're in this kind of funny time where it's like, well, how do we take this entire fintech ecosystem that's already leveraging these API services and slowly migrate them over to open banking? And for some of them, they're kind of, you know, they're kind of sitting there thinking, well, what do I get with open banking that I don't get already? And it's kind of like, you know, convince me of this. But, you know, over, over time, there will be many kind of benefits. So one of the things that we're working through them is, um, okay, open banking reduces a whole series of new rules. Uh, which I'll actually cover soon. Um, and then it's a matter of kind of like, how do we help kind of phase that in? So it's not it's not a drop everything that you've done and all the systems you've built and all the models and engines and kind of switch over to this new format. There actually is a kind of sequence of steps that's kind of involved. And what our kind of recommendation for them is, is that, um, and, and, and the whole kind of intention behind this is not just to show you how a FinTech should consider um, switching over from one API service that relies on digital data capture to open banking. But I'm also hoping with this to show you exactly what some of the key kind of principles around open banking are um, and how it kind of forces some of these um, companies to think at differently. So, so we kind of looked at it and we tried to work out, well, what are those steps? What are those steps that um, we would recommend to our customers to do um, and to the actually industry um, as a whole and we've identified six um, three of which we feel incredibly confident about telling our customers to execute on um, one the one that's in orange is kind of like well you can kind of do it but it's open banking is moving all the time so we just don't know how it's going to kind of pan out in terms of timing and then the things in red are still items that are that haven't been really they haven't really been explored enough by uh, by the government itself or the government's actually going for a process of reviewing and you know correcting it or implementing new kind of ways as well. So we do have this bit of our kind of, here's some stuff you can do now, some stuff you really want to or to take into consideration and other things that um, we just tell our customers to wait on. And I'll actually cover each one of these. So um, first and foremost, user experience. So open banking is not just a series of APIs. There's also a UX guideline as well. They call it the consumer experience guidelines. That that state exactly how, what type of language to use when asking for consent. Um, things, some things that you must do, some things that you should do. So must do, for example, um, do not uh, electively kind of select all the data sharing items that the consumer select which data they wish to share, um, so to speak. Do not kind of uh, by default tick yes, you know, um, leave it kind of open. So it has things like that to use and also kind of a standard um, language as well. So the experience from going from one fintech to another is always consistent, so to speak. So, and I think they've done a really good kind of, kind of job on this. Open banking itself also consists of 
um, and I actually say it's less about open banking, it's more about CDR as a whole, they've actually identified five different types of consents that are worthwhile kind of mentioning. So first consent is a collection consent. So that's, um, you know, do you allow me to collect the actual data? Um, the second one is use consent. So uh, a business who wants to use this API services, wants to leverage this data, has to disclose all the different types of usages that um, that they will, you know, of what they will do with that particular data once they actually get it. So a good example is um, one, if we say, do you, uh, do you enable me to collect your account and transaction data? Yes. Um, can I use this data to do a credit risk assessment? That's our type of usage. Um, disclosure consent. So disclosure consent could be, do you allow me to share this data with your accountant? Yes or no. Um, direct marketing consent is type of a use consent, but with a few kind of stricter kind of rules around what you can and can't do. Um, and a de de identification consent is, okay, once I've done using the data itself, do you allow me to retain this data in an anonymized format, yes or no? And if the consumer selects no, then all the data has to be purged. So that's kind of user experience. Um, so, and this is an example of what that look, looks like, so to speak. So one of the things that we're kind of telling our customers is uh, because digital data capture has kind of what we call coarse grain consent, where effectively all you're asking a consumer to do is like, is to consent to accessing their banking data. Whereas now with CDR, open banking, um, we can do fine grain consent such as, okay, do you allow me to access your financial data? Yes, um, but which data? Is it account data, transaction data, personal details data and so forth? So they've got a whole series of claims. So one of the things that we're encouraging our customers to do and to think about is um, to start implementing that now, because even if they use a platform like BASIC to access uh, access banking data via the open banking uh, pipes, once that data gets inside their environment, they still have to respect and honor the policy that's attached to the data. So not only is the not only is the data kind of um, coming into their realm once they call it for API, they also have to respect the rules that are attached to the data as well. So one of the things I'm telling them is like, ask for them now, build those rules into your into your platform as soon as you can, because that's just the reality. Um, data governance. So we kind of covered that already a bit, but it's really kind of acknowledging the consent. It's also acknowledging the rules that are attached to the actual data. There's also other data governments uh, governance things as well. So, for example, if you ask uh, someone's consent to access the data, it can't be longer than 12 months. Um, after 12 months, that you have to that a consent expires, and you need to ask the individual to go through the reconsent process, which is effectively going from the beginning um, all over again to share the data. There's also other things you have to do about notifying consumers every three or six months, just to let them know, hey, I've got access to your data. Here's all the links you need in case you want to turn it off. Um, which is which is a good kind of consideration because um, some consumers will download an app, they'll share the data, they'll forget, and they'll kind of move on. This just puts those appropriate rails in place to make sure they're doing the right thing. Uh, the other thing is, <coughs> um, one of the other things that CDR uh, has in place is it has a very prescriptive security framework. So it actually tells you exactly what type of um, controls and measures you have to have in place, kind of acknowledging that this data is sensitive, that the consumer's data needs to be protected. And if you're going to participate in this whole um, ecosystem, then we hope you've got your shit together, so to speak. Um, and, and so it, it's, you know, one of the things that's worthwhile doing and anybody who deals with financial data should uh, do anyways to actually make sure that all the different parameters are secured. So things such as, you know, network and security of data and access controls and so forth as well. So we also kind of um, tell our customers, you know, like, I know you've heard us say it so many times, but it's going to get real because if you don't adhere to this, there's some pretty hefty penalties attached to it. Um, the one of the, even though CDR itself is across many different industries, so for example, banking and will be in utilities soon. Um, if we're just going to zone in on banking, it only at this stage, it only applies to institutions that are ADIs or authorized deposit taking institutions, i.e., banks. Um, so the government said anyone who's an ADI who has this license, you have to have 
um, you have to have APIs um, opened up and they have to look like this, which is great. Um, and that covers, I would say, well over 80% 80, 80 of the use cases. But the unfortunate reality um, in all of this is that customers' finances are not just held with banks. So there's other institutions that also hold financial data on us. So alternate lenders. Um, so for example, if it's a payday lender, if it's a business lender, um, whether it's uh, some kind of intermediary um, mortgage company um, and so forth. So they also hold financial data on us and as do the buy now pay laters as well. So they know exactly um, what we owe and what the repayment terms are. Unfortunately, many of those don't actually fall underneath this particular regime. Um, and I guess, hence the word banking and open banking. So that's a little bit unfortunate because some of the use cases uh, that, you know, if you're using this data to do a risk assessment, you want to have as comprehensive and complete picture as you can of the individual. So that becomes a lot more challenging when that's not available for open banking. Uh, so, so as a result of that, one of the things that we kind of expect will continue to happen is that there will be this mishmash of, I'm going to use open banking pipes to go get open banking data and for anything else I might you know, rely on digital data capture methods to be able to access the data and then I'll kind of bring it together and, you know, do that kind of risk assessment of the actual consumer. Um, the government has tried to address this uh, in a way um, through things such as reciprocity, effectively saying that, well, if you, if you happen to call this data, if you happen to run a business that does lending, then you're also going to be on the hook to expose APIs as well. So that's, we do have that in place but no one's pursuing it. So we don't know how hard they're gonna push in that, um, in that particular respect. Uh, the, and then the, one of the other things that I mentioned earlier was just around the accreditation process, uh, incredibly onerous. So we, as an organization, spent over a hundred and something thousand dollars just to become accredited. We're accredited, but we're not live yet. Um, and we're not live because we're not trying to hurry, uh, because even if we were live, not one of our customers can use open banking yet unless they go through the same rigorous process. So the government has addressed this shortcoming and they are, you know, we're expecting hopefully in the next month or two that they will release kind of lighter accreditation tiers that will enable our customers to be able to start consuming open banking a lot faster. So I think that that's one of the missed kind of points in all of this. And, and then finally, just in terms of, um, you know, some of the other um, things to kind of keep in mind with uh, open banking as well is also the fact that it's a phased approach as well. So even as it stands now, I think we've got about 30 or so banks that are uh, data holders, the banks that you can consume data through, which is great. But unfortunately, not all of the account types or all the data is accessible through that yet there is a schedule there is a time frame by, by which they have to open up that data um, so that's the other kind of catch is just because it's there doesn't mean it's complete uh, so what i mean by that is for some banks you still can't retrieve credit card data and you still can't retrieve um, uh, mortgage data so um, but they do have deadlines of when they have to make that data accessible by the other part that we don't know and i guess the tip the the test of time will actually tell us is the quality of the data that's actually coming out as well. So keep in mind that the data that we see for our internet banking portals might be coming from one system, um, which the bank has had, you know, the last kind of 30 years to develop, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, that same data is coming through the, their APIs. Um, you know, in some instances that API data is coming straight from their core system, doesn't have that filter on top. So we're seeing all kinds of interesting data getting exposed. Um, we're definitely seeing some level of corruption. So um, so we're also kind of a bit of a test guinea pig for those banks as well. So these are kind of, these are things I just wanted to kind of cover. Um, that's my first 25 minutes. I'm gonna open up for questions and hopefully you got something out of this. Okay, thanks to me. That was a great, Great overview of the open banking uh, regime uh, from somebody who's clearly going through the uh, process. So, I mean, open banking is, its intention is to um, 
enable innovation in the financial services sector. I guess maybe it's early days yet, but I'm interested in your perspective on it. Is, do you think it is delivering innovation or is it uh, a bit of a handbrake at the moment? What, what's your overall thoughts about the positives um, and the, the negatives? Look, I think over time it definitely will. Um, I think we've got uh, one of the one of the unfortunate things that we in the tech industry love to do is we like to hype things up um, yeah. to the point where you know open banking has been hyped up so much that I, as the founder of a platform that provide access to the data, had to scratch my head and think like, what's the difference? I was like, so um, I, there's not much difference besides the fact that it's regulated and governed and it's got kind of safer controls in place. So. Um, Innovate, does this data help innovation? Yes, it does by far. If you think about, if you think about a fintech app that's just a fintech business, who's think about a startup, they've just built their app, they've deployed in the app store. Um, they're trying to convince you to switch over to them to use their their financial service product. They don't know anything about you uh, mm -hmm. compared it to a bank who you've been with for the last 30, 40 years, and they know yeah. everything about you. Um, but all of a sudden, by using a service like ours, we can bring in the last two years worth of their data into their app. They can crunch those numbers and all of a sudden they know everything about you. And they can have those personalized conversations with you. They can evaluate your risk. They can tell you what's important to you and so forth. So I think definitely levels the playing field um, from that point of view. So the data itself is incredibly powerful. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting perspective in the sense that once you've been through that accreditation process, there should be a lot more trust that the, your average consumer in the street would put into your app, your your company, because you've, you've got the tick in the box from the ACCC. Yeah. And I think if you, I don't know if you caught the uh, keynote presentation this morning, which is all about API security, I think you know, mm -hmm. having, having a watchdog that's going to make sure that appropriate security is in place and that the appropriate trust is there is is a really fundamental part of building a healthy ecosystem. Yeah. Yes. I think it is. Um, I think one of the just one of the things that I've kind of observed through the rollout of this ecosystem is that there was a, a bit too much emphasis given to the consumer and the protection of the consumer, which is mm. great. That's, yeah. Uh, but that can sometimes be a little bit detrimental when you don't don't take the developers into consideration, the ones that are building the applications that consume this data. So there was a lot of, hey, consumer, what do you think? And let's build build this into it, but not enough, hey, FinTech, what do you think? So what yeah. we find is that, um, you know, a good example of where that kind of manifests itself is that um, a consumer going through the process of linking up their bank accounts. So you think about that download an app, that app knows exactly what data they need. They need accounts and transactions. Um, that the consumer says, great, I'm going to go connect my bank. I'm going to go select Westpac. I go for the process. Westpac, for that authorization process, Westpac says, hey, consumer, what data do you want to share with this app? And they're like, oh, I don't want to share my transactions. I'll share my term deposit account. And then right. they get the data and the fintech sitting there saying, I can't do anything with this. Right. So what yeah. we effectively done is we've introduced a way for the consumer to make a mistake, which is design 101, don't do that. Don't enable yeah. the consumer to make a mistake because the consumer doesn't know what type of data and all those claims and scopes and intricacies of how that fintech app works. So, you know, it's things like this that we have in place that I think, you know, one of the kinks we need to try and kind of iron out and work out. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, just very quickly, um, question from the channel. It seems like we've got an incomplete use case without the ability to transact through open APIs. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, incomplete use case. Look, I think we're transitioning. I think that that's the, you know, that's the most important part to acknowledge about an open banking API. They're not, you know, and rightly so. They didn't do a big bang approach. They said, well, let's phase it. So we're yeah. phasing it. That's that's the stage that we're actually going through now. Alternatively, we could have just kept talking about it for the next seven years and not see a single API. Um, at least we have something to call and something that we can critique. Um, and this criticism, you know, is going to be back loop and the government is listening and they are kind of acknowledging and moving forward on it. So I think it's it's just worthwhile noting that it's a transition itself. Um, it is a question, it is a very ambitious um, 
uh, ambitious uh, thing that we're trying to kind of roll out. And I hope that, um, and, and I hope ultimately that we're not getting ahead of ourselves because obviously we're already, um, we're already specking out the API for energy. What does that look like and so forth and encountering all kinds of issues there. And they're talking about other industries, but yet we haven't even got an open banking 100%, right? So um, that's the only, if I had to fault one thing, I would say that's, you know, that's one, but, you know. Yeah, we'll I think that's a, that's a pragmatic <laughs> attitude. Yeah, we we should, you know, take it, take it pragmatically so that we don't make mistakes along the way. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we're out of time. Um, thanks a lot, to me. That was uh, a really great talk, very enlightening. How do we find you on the uh, socials? Uh, easy, just go to um, basic.io. Um, we've got a free sandbox. You can play with it as well. Um, and otherwise on LinkedIn. Uh, that's usually Sorry. where I hang out these days. That's my equivalent of Facebook. So. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, to me. Cool. See Pleasure. You See you. Bye.